So it's an honor and a pleasure to give a talk. So thanks to the organizer for the invitation. So uh, let me uh, explain my t the title of my talk. So my setting is a uh, n plus one dimensional manifold with a metric G plus. So in this metric, this is a non-compact manifold. So we say it is a conformally compact means there exists a defining function such that rho squared g plus is compact. And in this case, if uh, there are since there are many, many choice of possible defining function, so if we denote h equal to rho square g plus, g plus restrict to the boundary, then h is defined up to some change of rho. So this is defined up to what we call conformal class of h. So it's a multiple of a positive function on H. So in that case, we call this X the conformal infinity of conformal infinity. So uh, uh, the particular class we will deal with of conformal compact manifold is if G plus satisfy the additional property, it is already a Poincaré Einstein match man manifold. So in my notation, I normalize it so that it is minus NG plus. And then in this case, we call this uh, x n plus 1 g plus uh, conformally compact Einstein manifold, CCE manifold, conformal compact Einstein manifold. The standard example is, of course, the model example is we take ball and then we take a, a G plus to be the hyperbolic man manifold. So in this case, if I denote this by 4 times dx squared, 1 minus x squared squared, and rho equal to 1 minus x squared, then in that case, this rho squared G plus is the flat manifold. So this is conformally compact Einstein manifold. And of course, there are more sophisticated examples, and like uh, ADS Schwarzschild. Manifold, which I will not write down, but there are a lot more, more sophisticated examples. So in this case, frequently we choose a better defining function called geodesic defining function. So if it's a CCE manifold, or in actually more general case, asymptotic hyperbolic manifold, there exists given H on a boundary, defined on a boundary, we can choose a geodesic defining function, a better geodesic defining function. We call it geodesic defining function, which exists and which satisfies the property. If we look at R square G plus, restrict to the boundary is equal to H, and which has the additional property that 
the gradient of the distance function on, uh, with respect to this metric is equal to 1 on a neighborhood of asymptotic neighborhood of the conformal infinity. There exists an R and an epsilon positive, so that this is true. So in this case, in this case, we can write this R plus G plus in this asymptotic neighborhood into dr squared plus gr. And where gr has some asymptotic expansion start with h and then plus r squared g2 and so on, power series expansion in this asymptotic neighborhood. So for example, on a sphere, it turns out this geodesic defining function r is 1 minus x over 1 plus x2. And then in this case, this r squared g plus hyperbolic metric happened to be dr squared plus 1 minus r squared squared divided by 4 squared, and then g on SM, standard model case. So I will come back to this asymptotic expansion a little bit later. So the question we are interested in is actually a question uh, proposed by Modacina. And in connection in a conformal field theory, he proposed, he asked the question, for what manifold is allowed to be asymptotic conformal infinity of a CCE manifold. So given MH, when, is, when can one fill in So uh, by a, a hyperbolic CC manifold such that this uh, M is the conformal infinity. Conformal field in. Okay. And there is a very uh, few very concrete progress on this problem. So let me mention the existence result. Uh, the existence result, including the result, famous work of Pfefferman, Graham, Robin Graham, and in 85, and with complete detail in 07, and where they construct such a conformal feeling in, in an asymptotic neighborhood of M. So there exists an epsilon positive, and then G plus, uh, this is a CCE. They did something more than that. They did an ambient metric construction, such that this, uh, uh, this uh, G plus R square restricted to the boundary is the given edge, and this is uh, on a neighborhood, M cross zero epsilon. Okay. And their work is uh, depending on power series expansion of H, so they assume H is real analytic. And this work has been extended by Gursky and uh, uh, Sakata Kivi. Uh, could I? Uh, Sakata. The heating. Uh, last year, a couple of years ago, this is gobble. Uh, 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 for H, he is a smooth manifold without real analytic assumption. And then there is another uh, existence result. And the only a concrete existence result by Lee and pa uh, Jack D and Robin Graham. Graham and D. 
Jack Lee. And this is uh, uh, in, I don't know the time, okay. Uh, Jack Lee in 91, where they show that in a neighborhood of the sphere, of the sphere, this standard example sphere, on a neighborhood of sphere, and if we have this canonical metric, then in an asymptotic neighborhood of this, if H is in an asymptotic, say, C infinity neighborhood of uh, the standard metric, then one can conformally fill in. And so these are the existence result, but it turns out there is also a non-existence result and given in uh, by Gursky and Han, and, and later extended to more general case by Gursky, Han, and Stoltz. And what uh, the first paper shows is on S4K minus 1, H, if K is bigger than or equal to 2, for example, S, S7, and if the H is of positive Yamabe class, that means the scalar curvature of H is positive, then uh, B8, there exists actually infinite many connected component of positive scalar curvature metric such that does not allow B4K fill in. It does not allow that. And uh, uh, this uh, work was extended later to more general cases if one can talk about spin manifold of dimension 4K, and then in that case, which does not allow fill in on certain type of conformal infinity with positive scalar curvature. So the whole result uh, uses uh, some kind of index theorem of Atiyah, Singer, Prototi, uh, which I will not give the detail, but the one key fact they have used is the following. Okay. And this is a result uh, by Jack Lee and uh, uh, based, actually by Qin Jie, but based on uh, uh, early result of Lee. So the observation is if the boundary Yama B class is positive on CCE manifold. If the boundary Yama B, so M is uh, this uh, conformal infinity, and if the boundary Yama B class is positive, then so boundary has a curve metric of positive scalar curvature, then the interior is a compact manifold is also positive. Okay. So you imply they exist, and their proof is constructive. Okay. So they construct sun G bar, which is uh, a conf uh, equal to a comp R squared G plus, and this R is the geodesic defining function of H so that Scalar curvature is positive. I will come back to this fact later. Okay, so this is the non existence result. And now I want to, so uh, the open question now is what happened when uh, k equal to 2? So uh, k equal to 1. So the open question is, still open question is, how about on S3H, 
and with, uh, say, scalar curvature of H positive. So in that case, does it allow a B4 conformal compact Einstein fill in? And this is still an open question. And in that direction, I like to mention there is a result of uh, Fernando Marcus. In this case, there is only one connected component of positive scalar curvature metric. So the difference is here on S4K minus 1, there are infinite many connected components of positive scalar curvature metric. There exists only one. So the question is, since for the standard H metric on S3, you have a conformal filling in, can you extend this to arbitrary positive scalar curvature metric? And this question is still very open. Okay. And, but uh, that explains the effort to approach the compactness problem. So the hope is maybe if there is a compactness process estimate, then one can establish some degree theory to approach this problem. But uh, this uh, still is very far away. So the compactness problem we are proposing is the following. Given a sequence of metric on the boundary, and uh, suppose it is a compact family. We already know these are the uh, filling in. You can fill in by some, uh, this is already the conformal infinity of some CCE manifold on the interior of X. Would well, that uh, imply some GI is compact on X. Okay. And for this problem to be well posed, what we are really proposing is in the same conformal class of HI, suppose you have some representative which is compact, and then in the compact filling in, can you find some representative which is also compact on X. Okay. So that's the question we are trying to handle. So for this question, the first answer problem is uh, why couldn't the boundary behavior decide the interior behavior where uh, GI say equal to RI squared H GI plus? You already have a sequence of CCE manifold. Okay. So, and the question there is because of the following phenomena. Because HI does not completely decide GI. And to see that, say, suppose we write R equal to R squared GR. G plus, and that's the geodesic defining function, and then it's uh, equal to dr squared plus gr, like I write before, and then this g, say, when n equal to 3, has a power series expansion. Start with h, and then, because it uh, has a totally geodesic boundary, so this uh, second order term is 0, and the next order term is g2, and then followed by the third order term, G3, and so on. So in this case, one can compute, since this G plus is Einstein, we, G2 is already completely determined, and it's equal to minus, so this metric alpha beta is actually the Shelton tensor of H. So this P is uh, this notation of Shelton tensor, dimension minus 2 re C minus scalar over 2D minus 1G, PG. OK. 
the P of G, Shelton tensor. So we know it's the Shelton tensor of the boundary metric. But on the other hand, G3 is not determined by H. In fact, there's a famous example and of uh, Hawking and Page where one can see on the same boundary S1 cross S2 cross S1, there exists different fueling in where their G3 is different. So in this case, actually G3 equal to minus one third DD normal of the RC of G G metric. So uh, this is, uh, in some sense, a Neumann data of the metric, a third order Neumann data of the metric G. So it's a non-local quantity. It's not determined by the local behavior of H. Okay. So the whole question is how to control this G3 from information of H. Okay, so, and now the second question is, we given this conformal class, a natural representative is HY, so we choose this to be the Yamabe metric. Let's fix that to be this, and this is of positive, and we assume this is a, a constant scalar curvature. And now the question is, what is a good representative in a corresponding conformal filling in G, G? Okay. And then, of course, the first thing one wants to try is how about G? Why? Yamabe metric, constant scalar curvature. And the difficulty we have this is it's not clear how to control the boundary behavior of GY in terms of HY. So if we have a manifold with boundary, on the interior we have existence resolve of uh, Yamabe metric on the boundary we have, and we do not know do not see how to control all the GY on the boundary and the relation of that to HY. That involves the geometry and topology of the manifold. So instead, here we propose to choose another representative. I'm going to explain why this we think is a natural choice. We choose a metric G star. Now I restrict my attention to n equal to three. So we have a three plus one manifold. We choose a metric G star in G. What is this metric? In this metric, we solve the PDE minus the plus W given H on the boundary. We choose this to be three. This is equal to n equal to three on x4. We solve this PDE. And then this w is relating, so h has the geodesic defining function r. This is starting with log r. Okay. So asymptotic expansion of this. And then the g star metric is defined to be E to W, this Poincaré Einstein metric. So that's definition. So I will explain why this is a metric. And this metric has first occurred in the work of Pfefferman and Gren and in the study of the renormalized volume. and also in the work of uh, Myshoff and Qingjie and Po Yang. Okay. 
be normalized volume. So we choose this to be the metric. I will explain why this is a natural choice now, okay, later. So the, uh, let me first state the theorem we have, and then I will come back to explain the notation. So in this case, we have three theorems. And the first result is, uh, remember, we are trying to approach this uh, compactness result, which uh, by its nature, the condition which one pulls in should be conformal invariant quantity. So we try to formulate the condition in terms of conformal in in quantity. Uh, I'm going to state uh, the theorem in a special case of B4. The result can be more general than this, but let me state this in this. So suppose I have GI plus a sequence of CCE manifold. Okay. And now I have the corresponding boundary thing, and suppose this is the Yamabe metric, and I'm assuming this is constant scalar curvature and then the scalar curvature of GY has a lower bound, positive lower bound. So that's my assumption. And the assumption is this sequence GY is CK plus 3 compact on S3 and on the boundary. K bigger than or equal to 2. That's my assumption. And the first theorem we can get is a perturbation result. I'm sorry, I forget to mention my co-author. And uh, this is a joint work of myself and Yu uh, Xing Ge and Qing Jie. So the first theorem we have is that uh, uh, we have a perturbation result. There exists epsilon positive. If the vial curvature, this is vial curvature, of the family GI plus, it turns out it's a vial curvature. The L known square is a quantity invariant of the conformal class. So if uh, this is less than epsilon, then the family, so let me call that A1 condition, then uh, uh, the corresponding GI star is CK compact, CK plus 2 alpha compact. Uh, so we get this uh, compactness result, and uh, this is a modular diffeomorphism. Uh, actually, we can say something stronger. Actually, there exists there exists diffeomorphism which pull this phi i star of uh, my metric g i star to a metric which is we call G star FG metric. Okay. So what is this? I forgot to say what is this. Okay. So this uh, G I star on B4, standard B4, S3, this uh, G hyperbolic metric, the G star metric, which we say call it defined to be just the standard metric is, in this case, is actually, one can write down, it's exponential 1 minus x squared dx squared. It's not a flat metric. There is this weight to make the boundary totally geodesic. So it's this metric, everything is poured in. So this theorem has a, a corollary. One corollary of this is 
Uh, in the existence theorem, we have uh, this uh, Lee and the Gran metric. For any metric GH in a neighborhood of the standard metric on S3. And a corollary of this result is that metric is unique. Okay, so a corollary the D gram metric uh, for H in a neighborhood of GC. On, uh, on this uh, S3 <coughs> metric is unique. The conform for this metric, the conformal filling is unique. Because in this case, we pull everything. This will be more clear after I present the proof of this result. So we pull every of the fielding of such metric to the standard hyperbolic ball as base. And from there, uh, one can apply implicit function theorem, get the uniqueness. Okay. And it turns out that a more general theorem, theorem 2, we can get is on given under a zero assumption if we impose some more condition assume a two what are the other invariant condition on a two I mean what are the other invariant information, and that we have this G3 metric. And this G3 metric turns out to be another conformal, pointwise conformal invariant property. That is G3 hat. If uh, G hat equal to E to WG, then this is E to the minus WG hat. G, G hat. So this, the L1 known of G3 is a conformal invariant quantity. So we would like to say this A2 condition is the L1 known of this G3 metric. But on the other hand, we cannot quite reach there yet. So we denote SI to be this G3. Uh, metric G star I is third power expansion term. And the second condition we have is there is uh, no concentration of S term in the L1 sense. Okay, so this condition to say limit r tends to zero is a soup of i and then soup of x and on ball of radius x r of s i known equal to zero. That's the assumption. And then we have the same conclusion. We reach the compactness of the family. So uh, let me remark that uh, this condition is satisfied if Si is in Lp for any p bigger than 1. If it's uniformly in Lp, then this implies A0, A2. Or if uh, Si is sufficiently known, the L1 known is sufficiently small, it also implies A2. But at this moment, we have not been able to say if it's in L1, it is in this. Okay. And now there's a, a, a third theorem, which I will ex also explain. 
So this S is a tensor. It turns out we can also reduce the theorem to some other curvature quantity, scalar curvature property, and that's T. I will explain this notation. This T is defined to be one of the D scalar curvature of this G star I and D normal. So this is a scalar curvature. So theorem 3 says under A0, if we have some positivity of the Ti would imply the compactness. So uh, the positivity says the negative part of T doesn't concentrate. So under the condition that the limit inf of x in uh, m and then ball of x r t i equal to zero, uh, positive. Okay, then compactness. Okay, so that's the theorem. And now I will spend my time explaining why the choice of G and the relation between all these tensors. OK. So and for that, let me begin to explain, to talk about conformal invariance uh, on S3. Invariant quantity on four manifolds. Okay. And on n-dimensional manifold, we frequently talking about invariant quantity. That including constants, something like uh, this uh, Yamabe constant. By nature, because we define it to be inf over all metric in the conformal class. So this is an invariant. And for manifold with boundary, you also talk about this Yamabe invariance with boundary by fixed volume of the interior. And then there is the other invariant called the boundary Yamabe invariant. And the boundary edge by fixing the volume on the boundary. Okay, so those are the constant. And <coughs> then the question is, what are the? These are all second order invariant. So on four manifold, there is also the invariant G to vial curvature of G. This is a conformal invariant because vial for G hat is e to the minus 2 to w vial for G. So this is a pointwise conformal invariant. So this is an invariant. And what are the other invariants? So this is on four manifold. The f another f invariant, natural invariant for x four manifold without boundary is look at the gauss bonnet formula. And then there is this vial term. And then there is this other curvature term, and which is 1 6 scalar curvature minus Ricci square. Okay. So because it's a topological invariant, this is conformal invariant. So this quantity on four manifold is also a conformal invariant quantity, and uh, which turns out to be four times the second symmetric function of the Shelton tensor. So there is this invariant. So what happened on manifold with boundary? So on manifold with boundary, and so this invariant, there are this uh, 
curvature invariance, integral invariance, and tensor invariance. So uh, on x4 with boundary, if we look at the Gauss-Bonnet formula again, and then we, it turns out there is other, other way of writing the, man, the, the metric, and it turns out the natural way to write the, man, uh, the, the boundary invariant is to think about this uh, sigma 2 metric, this scalar curvature, to split it into some other term and into a Q curvature plus a T curvature. Okay, so relate to Q curvature. So what is Q? Okay, so Q curvature, this is a force Q, this is the Bronson's Q curvature. It's strange looking, but uh, it's equal to one half minus scalar curvature plus this uh, sigma 2 metric. Okay, plus this uh, sigma 2 metric. Uh, or uh, the, the power, the, the constant here always uh, uh, depending on you define the Shelton tensor. So it's four sigma two metric. Okay. So on close manifold, the integration of Q4 is the same as sigma two. But for some reason, we should add this fourth order term. And then the corresponding T curvature is equal to DD normal of D, D this. Because if one integrate this on the boundary, there is the leading order term of dr, and it turns out this curvature has other terms, something like scalar curvature times this, and all involve the second fundamental form of boundary. So in particular, in a closed four manifold, in a, a in a manifold with totally geodesic boundary, geodesic boundary, these uh, uh, other second fundamental term all disappear. And then the natural way is to write this into Q plus T. But why? Okay. So in this case, we have the uh, term becomes via square and plus Q turn on the interior and then plus this boundary term on the boundary T and plus some other pointwise conformal invariant term. Okay, so that's uh, the way to write Gauss-Bonnet formula, which is done by Gilkey and Bronson and also uh, my work with uh, Gilkey and Bronson much earlier in the 80, 90, okay, early 90s. And this way, this is a pointwise invariant on the boundary, so Q plus T is an invariant. So why this is a natural splitting? And one of the reasons is, in this case, Q would be connected with a linear operator, so is T. T will be connected with a third order boundary invariant operator. So in particular, there is an operator P4, which is a pointwise operator P4, and such that P4 of G operating on W plus QG equal to QG hat E4 W. So there's this uh, P4 is an operator which has the leading order term is Laplace, but it's a linear operator. So one can describe this Q curvature by a linear operator. So that's why this uh, Q occur in this uh, statement of the theorem. Okay, so now let me, let me uh, say, and then, 
There, the other conformal invariant quantity is the critical point of the vial tensor, and that's called Bach tensor. And Bach tensor is also a pointwise invariant, b hat equal to multiple times b. And then this Bach tensor is a second covariant differentiate of vial and plus Ricci vial. Okay. And this uh, is uh, in particular if the metric is conformal Einstein. implied Bach tensor equal to zero. Okay. So we do have an equation for the metric which is conformal to Einstein. And this is for four manifold with boundary, with, without boundary. So on manifold with boundary, one also need to consider the contribution of this pointwise boundary term and then the invariant it induced on the boundary. And it turns out a natural invariant quantity is second fundamental form, and then the vial alpha n, beta n on the boundary. And if one consider this invariant, one get the critical point, critical point is something called S tensor. And S tensor is, in general, involving first derivative of the vial, because it comes from vial. But uh, uh, there are many different ways of rewriting the S tensor. So in particular, for metric which is with totally geodesic boundary, we can rewrite it. And it turns out to be our G3. So in general, you have this S, which is a pointwise conformal invariant on the boundary. And then this S tensor in the case, if G is with totally geodesic boundary, happen to be minus 3 over 2 times our G3 tensor, OK, G3 tensor. So in some sense, we are going to study this conformal Einstein manifold for using Bach flat condition and with the corresponding matching boundary, and that comes from this G3. So in this case, in order to use the Bach flat condition, there is the early work of Tien and Vyakovsky. They studied the Bach flat condition, but with scalar curvature, the main observation is if adding the condition, the Bach flat condition becomes elliptic. And in this case, it's Laplace Ricci is equal to Ricci and tensor. Okay. So they study this under four manifold adding scalar curvature condition. So what happens when R is not a constant? Then in that case, the system is no longer elliptic. Instead, we have an additional term to handle, and that's the hashing of the scalar curvature. Okay, the equation becomes this. We have additional term to handle. So given this background, let me write down the key property of the G star metric and which explain why we choose this metric. So the lemma 
I have is for this G star metric, remember it is satisfied of plus W equal to 3. That's a metric, and this is uh, the metric with this conformal factor E to W has the following property. The first property is, of course, the property that it restricts to the boundary is my edge. And it turns out one can also compute to see the scalar curvature restrict to the boundary is three times the scalar curvature on the boundary. And then the second property is because on four manifold, Einstein manifold, we really know what's that P4 operator. And so this constant is the magic so that the Q4 of G star is equal to 0. So it satisfy this Q4, I'm sorry, I, I, yeah, this Q4 uh, Laplace R plus some quadratic curvature term is 0, satisfies some fourth order PDE in terms of the metric. But in order to use this property, we have a fourth order thing. In order to control the growth, we need some second order constraint. And then the main observation is Rh positive implies Rg star also is positive on x. We have fourth order thing, but we have a second order constraint. And then the third property we have is that it allows us to use this Bach flag condition. So this Bach flag condition, G star, set, uh, has epsilon regularity property with respect to the uh, Bach flag condition. Condition. So when the energy is sufficiently small, we can begin to gain. And again, in terms of the curvature and then the S tensor or the G3 curvature on the boundary. So there is a satisfied epsilon regularity. Once we reach some C1 smoothness, we can begin to gain C2, C3. So that makes us think this is a natural metric to study. So let me just say a word. Uh, I'm running out of time, but uh, just let me say that the proof of this property is depending on the original proof of Li and uh, Qingjie, and it's a constructive proof using scattering theory, continuum method and scattering theory. Okay, and. I run out of time, but let me uh, uh, at least sketch the proof of theorem 3 and say, uh, theorem 1 and say, proof of theorem sketch. So this is the perturbation result. I'm saying that if vial is sufficiently small, then I reach compactness, reach compactness. And of course, this is a proof by contradiction. And suppose this uh, metric GI star is, uh, so let me call GI equal to GI star. So uh, suppose it's not compact, we rescale to make it compact. So if we let a GI bar to be some multiple of GI star, so this GI such that, suppose this is not, so this metric has bounded curvature. Okay. So the idea is to run this GI star. So this GI bar would converge in some chrome of post of sense to some compact manifold. Okay. And then the thing is, 
we have this GI, which is uh, uh, this uh, conformal Einstein, and this uh, E to WI conformal factor. And this W has some control in terms of its scalar curvature. The scalar curvature of this is positive, means E to W of gradient GI of WI is bounded. Okay. So there is a control of this. And this can be passed into the scale of the metric. So the offshot is this WI bar would converge uniformly on compact to some metric G infinity bar. So where are we now? We are saying this metric converge and this conformal factor converge. So the offshot here is we say that this GI original, this uh, Einstein metric also converge because this G infinity bar is equal to E to W infinity bar. This converge. This means this guy converge. Okay, so this converge. This also converge. That forces the background Einstein metric to converge. And then the assertion we are having the condition of A1 imply this metric, Einstein metric, has vial vanishes. Okay, because it's L2 known is invariant, so the value of this term is identical to zero. Okay. And then the other thing is we haven't used our assumption on the boundary. The assumption on the boundary H I Y compact means it's a rescaled metric converges to the flat metric because you pull. So this converges to this. And then that means the underlying at the blowing point, this boundary to this, uh, the infinity, the boundary of infinity in this rescaled metric is R3. Okay. So we are in a situation. On the boundary, we have flat metric. On the interior, we have uh, uh, metric, which is Einstein, which has value equal to zero. So we claim this metric must be the standard hyperbolic metric. And so an observation is the following. So what we do is uh, we say that uh, this uh, uh, metric we claim the corresponding G infinity plus metric is the hyperbolic metric. Okay. And uh, this is uh, in our notation dx squared plus dy squared over y squared on R4 plus up to a covering. It's equal to R4 plus. How do you achieve that? Okay. So the, the thing to see is we now have a two metric. One is our limiting metric. One is the hyperbolic metric. In a hyperbolic metric, we already have uh, y as the conformal w, say, uh, w equal to log y. Make it a compact, I mean compact modular, the infinity metric is a uh, compactified compactify it. And on this metric, we have our W infinity bar uh, 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 modify it. We claim that this forces W infinity bar to be the same as W. That's the log Y. And uh, then the underlying thing is hyperbolic. And it turns out it's boiled down to a lemma. We begin to consider W minus W infinity bar. This is law. Okay. And this is satisfying this PDE 
because our choice of G star satisfy the fourth order PDE double Laplace U on X. And then when one plays with it, one has U equal to gradient U equal to Laplace U equal to zero on R3. That means this thing restrict to the boundary is equal to zero. Okay. And then we want to conclude, con conclude U is identical to zero, which turns out is not true. Say, for example, if u equal to y cube, then one check this is, say, think about this as r4 plus. And this is satisfied. Okay. It turns out we need an additional assumption, and that additional assumption is due to the fact our metric g star has positive scalar curvature. And so is this uh, w infinity bar. So the condition we have is this u square is positive on uh, r4 plus. Adding this condition, and it turns out under this assumption, we have u equal identical to 0. That's the Liu view theorem. Okay? And from there, we conclude our metric is actually the weight factor is log y, and the metric is flat which contradict with the fact the curvature blow up at one point. So that's the proof of theorem one. Okay. So uh, let me just say one word about uh, uh, the proof of theorem two and theorem three. And in the proof of uh, theorem two, I need, we need to derive this assumption from other assumption from the A2 assumption, and that we use the result of local uniqueness extension of Piquard and uh, Hertzrich. And uh, also, after you do it locally, you can use unique continuation result of Calderon to say this is happening. That's the proof of theorem 2. And then, for the proof of theorem 3, it depends on a fact which is not easy. Okay? And that is, if we look at this S tensor, this G3 tensor, it turns out for the limiting metric, if that's identical to zero, one can show this T metric is identical to zero. That's relatively easy. And what is a bit work is to show that the T tensor, the T curvature vanishes, imply the tensor, S tensor vanishes. And uh, that again use scattering theory, depending on work on scattering metrics, on such type of asymptotic hyperbolic metric. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>